All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on my presentation. This is um, craniosacral therapy, trauma resolution, and somatic experiencing in perinatal populations. I just want to introduce myself a little bit more because uh, I am director of education, but I'm also a somatic practitioner. While uh, some people don't really know what that is, so I'd like to talk just a minute about that. I also want to say I'm originally trained in maternal and child health as a communications professional, and I worked for years in Africa. And it was there that I fell in love with research and data. So I, I love information, um, so I resource with that, and I bring that into most of my presentations. I'm also a storyteller, trained in storytelling. So today, I want you to feel really welcome, and I'm also going to tell you a few stories. Uh, I also am a body worker, a long-time body worker. I've been a body worker since 1995. And one thing that they don't tell you when you sign up to be a body worker is how exquisitely sensitive your hands and your body become. So for those of you who are in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. You, you feel things in your body. So I'm going to try and convey some of that as I'm speaking today. But that, that is um, my primary way of working with people. So just like some people would say, so what, pre and perinatal, what, what's that? Um, so through most of the 20th century, neither medicine nor psychology provided an accurate understanding of the nature of babies in the womb or babies at birth. And that's what we've been talking about at this conference. Among the serious errors were these. Babies are passive and helpless. Babies don't learn or remember. Babies are not capable of emotion and babies do not feel pain. These views misled parents and misdirected professionals in their work with babies. We now know that babies feel pain. They have experiences in the womb and are able to communicate about these womb experiences in birth. And that even though babies do not have a neocortex that can process information the way adults do, they do convey their own messages. They have a rich life in utero. Through the advent of ultrasound, we've been able to see that. They're richly equipped with their senses, and they're reactive to the environmental conditions, are expressive of feelings, and are attentive to both love and danger. So I want to talk about my influences. I, I think that having been in graduate school, I'd like to, you to know a little bit about what's behind me. So I do not stand up here alone. I've had many, many teachers over the many years that I've worked 17 years in craniosacral therapy. These are my current primary uh, influences, but I've had many craniosacral teachers and many bodywork classes and many massage therapy years. In the perinatal therapies, Ray Castellino, Myrna Martin, Tara Blasco, and Mary Jackson are currently my, 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 my primary ed, ed, teachers, mentors, and have been with me a long time. But I also want to highlight, I was in, in deep partnership with Lois Trezeis, who was a midwife. I was very, very fortunate to work with a midwife. She, uh, she and I prepared couples and for birth, and she would catch the babies, and I would catch the families. And I learned a lot about what it takes to be a birth professional from being in relationship with her. Then in somatic experiencing, how many of you know what somatic experiencing is? Are there any somatic experiencing practitioners in the room? One, okay. How about craniosacral therapy? How many? I see it's taught here at this university. That's kind of cool. All right, I was trained by Aria Gioretto Burns Galloway, and this is a new practitioner, Ber uh, Bridget Vitskins. She's had a profound influence on me, and it's, it's her variety of touch and presence and verbal skills that I practice uh, that really, really changed with the way I do things. So simply identified, oh, oops, I want to say all the families I've worked with over the years, and especially the mother and baby dyads. This has been my passion um, ever since I came back from Africa in 1993. So this is, this is what, I, what I live to do, is to work with mothers and babies. So simply defined, I, I work with changing states in the body and therefore the mind. I recognize health increasing capacity. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and releasing old patterns, creating new ones. My key messages today are that humans are about patterns on every level. 
biological, psychological, emotional, neurological, movement, gesture, habit, societal, cultural. We are adaptive, so patterns can change. Our job is to become aware of the pattern. Fixation, or fo so somehow getting caught up or looped in a certain pattern, that, that's when it becomes ingrained, especially in our bodies. It creates issues, mostly pain. Um, prevention is key, starting with pregnancy and babies, and I do a lot of work with pregnant moms. So how does all that happen? So just today, for those of you who are not familiar with what I'm talking about, I just want you to hold these stories, just consider them in a gentle way. And also for those stories I'm talking about today from my own clients, they um, have given me permission to tell you their stories. So please hold them in a light. So we're going on a journey. And for some, it may be far from shore. I'm going to have three ports of call, somatic experiencing, perinatal and prenatal somatic health, and craniosacral therapy. I call it full spectrum because it's a combination of touch. It's deeper touch, lighter touch, and a moving touch. I'm going to anchor these experiences, these therapies, these theories with case studies. So before we take off on our journey, I just wanted to give you some tools. So I've been teaching about the perinatal work for a long time. And I, there are those of you in the audience I know who have been doing this a long time as well. And we know that sometimes when we get up here and we start talking about these experiences, that sometimes it can move you in a, perf in a personal or a professional way. So I just want to say that, that if, if this happens to you, if you get taken away by some of the things I'm telling you, feel free just to pause, call pause, or be in our own bodies, like slow down. And just like we did last night after the movie, just feel contact in your seat, in your seat. You can feel the back of your chair. I'm doing that right now, just feeling my, my shoes, my feet, my body, and then your breath. So we may just pause a little bit as we move along. Okay, first some definitions. So this, these are the populations I work with, couples, pregnant women, and their support team. Mother baby dyads especially. I, I work a lot with babies who are having trouble. Um, mostly it's breastfeeding. So, um, families with babies and children who had difficult births. And then I have adults that come to me who are, know that they have some kind of early trauma. And they come to me because a pattern has, is in their life that, that talk therapy can't seem to touch. Up until, I think, a couple years ago, I was always the last person that people would come see that person on the edge of the town, that, that go see that person there. But now I'm, I'm becoming referred to by pediatricians, psychotherapists, medical doctors, lactation consultants. But I want, I want to just start with some statistics. And I, we saw a lot of them yesterday. I have a couple that were not included there. So I just want to talk about birth trauma. Penny Simpkin, who is here today. Thank you, Penny. Another one of our true and honored elders. Defines birth trauma as when the individual, mother, father, or other witness, believes that the mother's or her baby's life was in danger, or that a serious threat to the mother's or baby's physical or emotional integrity existed. She states that between 25 and 35% of women report that their births are traumatic. Kendall, Kathleen Kendall Tackett reports that one in four women who give birth will express the symptoms of PTSD. Yeah. So we saw a lot about maternal and infant mortality yesterday, so I'm going to quickly go through these. So we have here almost 24 maternal deaths per 100,000 in 48 states. And I have some, some images to show you, the similar ones that Stephen showed us yesterday. But I have this figure, which I got from the CIA. I was hoping Stephen would be here today. So I, this is from the World Factbook. Uh, we are number 167 of 224 countries that, that the CIA is following. But it's listed from the very first one is the, mo is the highest infant mortality, which is Afghanistan at 115 
per 1,000 births. So think about that, just all the way down. We're getting closer to having less. In fact, when I checked the World Factbook last night, we had gone down a little bit, even from when I wrote this presentation a few weeks ago. So we're between Serbia and Croatia, America, in between Serbia and Croatia. So with all our healthcare spending, you'd think that it would be a little different. Breastfeeding is where I think we're seeing some of the best news. Uh, so while we are below the healthy people 2020 target of 25% at 22.3% exclusively breastfed at six months, I just want to say, who here is a lactation consultant? Bravo. I mean, I, I just really am so encouraged by what I'm seeing in the breastfeeding world. So um, among infants born in 2013, four out of five started to breastfeed. So that's 81%. That's up 6% since um, I started, I did a lactation course two years ago. So we're rising, things are rising quickly. Over half, which was 51%, were breastfeeding at six months, which is good. Almost one third were breastfeeding at 12 months. So what I, what I like the most about the statistics I'm reading is that baby-friendly hospitals are now at 18.3%. When I started teaching about perinatal psychology, we were at 3% of our hospitals in the United States were baby-friendly. I don't know if you all know what that means. Do you all know the baby-friendly, what baby-friendly? It, it really helps. Um, we go through those nine steps. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later with Raylene Phillips' Sacred Hour, but. This is when they leave the baby undisturbed on the mother for an hour, and it is very hard for policy uh, people in, in hospitals to make this change over. So I just want to say, from three percent to eighteen percent in the last ten years, I mean that's I mean that's fantastic. Um, so I know that number may, may be small to you, but um, I I really am so encouraged. But here's where I'm not so encouraged. Uh, we're looking at fifth, one in one in five pregnant women now have this moderate to severe symptoms. When I started, it was one in 10. So this is really accelerating. But if you look at, uh, so here again, one, one in, about one in five of minor depression. But look at that statistic for low income and teens. The, um, the postpartum, postpartum Support International says up to 60% of our low income and teenagers are experiencing these, these mood disorders. Okay. I want just to show you these figures quickly. We saw some of this yesterday, just looking at the disparities of the black non-Hispanic populations. Here again is the maternal death that we saw yesterday, but I like these figures because they show, look at that steep decline when we're looking at these other countries that are declining. And then here, look at the disparities again. This is what we were talking about yesterday. And this is from 2011. So who knows where that is now? This is from that um, September 4th uh, uh, article in the Washington Post, no, New York Times, excuse me, and it shows again that our increase in maternal death, like what's happening in America, right? All right. Economics, I really like to talk about this man, uh, James Heckman, which was also mentioned yesterday by Stephen So we, he, we have here, he, analyze prevention dollars, so, so how much money do we save if we invest in early childhood? It was uh, $7 per every $1, and here is again that graph we look to see. So why are we doing this? Why aren't we investing more prenatally? I thought our, our speakers yesterday really had a very convincing argument about the efficacy and the value, but here we have even more data, so it's better now to invest in this part of our development, or human development, um, let's see, you can see the decline here, and, and how, much, uh, how much return on investment for later in life. So why is this important to you? Our history and our present experiences are connected to our nervous system. Some memories may lie beneath our conscious memory in our bodies, or implicit procedural memory, and I'm going to be talking about that today. Stages of health and well-being, well -being and how to promote them, especially our innate abilities to heal. So I'm talking about healing today. Start when we are babies. So just quickly, a little bit more evidence, since I like that. We talked about this yesterday, too. This is the Ghost in Your Genes. is a documentary that was published in 2007. 
This is an excellent documentary. It's part of our online education program and it talks about the impact of the environment around a developing baby. It, it, talked, it talks about that Dutch famine or winter hunger that Stephen mentioned yesterday. So babies in that first trimester during the famine developed obesity and cardiovascular issues later in life. And we also heard about the research of Rachel Yehuda on some of the trauma that can pass. Her research is on the Holocaust, but also on the 9-11 tragedy. We haven't yet seen the research of Catherine Monk. Um, she was also in that in utero movie. Her, her laboratory at Columbia University uh, looks at the impact of, of mood disorders in pregnancy and on our, on our developing babies. And they show, she has recently published some research that shows how if a baby is developing inside a woman who's anxious, they are hardwired for being overstimulated very easily, being very dysregulated by novel stimuli. And so we, we want our babies to feel comfortable, to feel relaxed, to feel curious about the world. And uh, her research is profound, and I would, I would certainly encourage you to go look at them. But it, it's not only our researchers that are seeing the difference. Here's from, this is from 2005, Newsweek. We're looking at the babies and how they are, can interpret the world around us. Of course, there was this groundbreaking book and article from science writer Annie Murphy Paul. But the parent, parenting magazines and science of parenting, popular press is coming on. And um, here is the new book I talked about last night, Prenatal Development and Parents' Lived Experiences. It's just come out in August. And this is uh, from Anne Diamond Weinstein. She is one of our uh, young professionals that's come through Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. And her book talks about the health of women and girls and how we're seeing an autonomic nervous system intense uh, response to the world around us. And we, we're now having a revolution in health looking at our autonomic nervous system. And I, I thought about the question that Elsa, I don't know if you're here today, you asked about what is our common language it could be through the nervous system, and I'm going to be talking a lot about that today. So the popular press understands this, and some of our, our, our professionals do as well. Here's from the Healthy Children Project. This is a, 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 a training about that baby-friendly hospital, but we also have Raylene Phillips, who I know is also here today. Um, she wrote an article about the sacred hour, and if you, so those of you who've seen her presentations, they're, they're beautiful um, at our national and at their international congresses. So Raylene, thank you so much. Um, but, but we know that, that these programs have meaning and, and change lives, and they're establishing healthy patterns. And no discussion about patterns would be, incom would be complete if we didn't talk about attachment. Here's John Bowlby, Mary Answorth, Mary Main. All of the research is one of the most heavily researched areas um, in health. Uh, so this is, uh, well, maybe that's not quite true, but since the 1950s, the, the discourse on attachment is intense. We also have more um, research coming out. This is a very wonderful um, article written by Paul Bloom in the New York Times. And in fact, I have created a huge bibliography for you it's in the Dropbox, which I'm hoping that people are told about. I have the presentation, the bibliography, and some literature reviews that are annotated in some of the research in bodywork and craniosacral therapy with babies that's downloadable for you. So this is one of my favorites because he summarizes it. It's, and you can just Google it. It's a great summary of the research. And I've made a habit of collecting titles of the research. So here's one I like. Babies can spot nice and nasty characters. So infants as young as six months instinctively prefer helpful characters. So what? Six months? They can, they can tell if someone is not so good, nice, or nasty? I love this one. Infants stun scientists with amazing insights. <laughs> babies only look clueless. Right. So then the people are not seeing our babies, right? They just, this is what they, they see. Our babies is just these blobs. Are, but they know a lot more than you think, and that's the truth. That's the truth. And of course, uh, so here's our, I love this. We are in the midst of an infant revolution. So I've been at this a long time. Those 17 years was when I first started working um, with 
with birth and with this memory of in, that can happen during birth and for babies and prenates. And so uh, back in that, those days, I mean, I couldn't even talk about mirror neurons. I couldn't talk about implicit memory. These are all things I've seen happen. I mean, it's amazing to watch as a, as a, as a person who's been so committed to this, science discovering babies. Babies, la baby, baby laboratories are everywhere now. There's a new one in my city, University of Virginia, um, and they're, they're now just realizing babies are amazing, right? They know all this stuff. Let's study them. And of course, we'll be hearing about ACEs later, but this is one of my favorite, favorite studies. And it, it's been out a while since the mid-1990s. And But the way that they're taking the data and dicing and slicing it and making it meaningful, it's just amazing what's, going, what's happening. And I'm looking forward to hearing this talk later from Dr. Felitti. One of the things I like the most about the study is that the CDC looked at it and said, well, now addiction is not really a disease. It's related to these early adverse experiences. So I really highly recommend, if you have not read that or looked at that, there's some fabulous books out about it too. I just finished one called Childhood Disrupted. Very, very good. So here we are. Of course, you all have been here with us a while too. The womb is a classroom and every child attends. So is it safe to say that humans are about patterns from the inside out? But what is going on around the nervous system, the baby, the human, you, me? It happens. It, it influences what happens on the inside. Through neural firing, neural pathways, of course, we are very grateful to Heb for his theories that neurons that fire together, wire together. But sometimes it's not what happened, but what didn't happen when it should have. So here we are. Neural pathways. So I am a sentient conscious being, this baby says. I have experiences in utero and during birth and neonatally, and these experiences leave imprints that affect the way I see the world. So here are my triangle of therapies. I'm going to go through each one. I'm going to tell you stories. Are you ready for our first port of call? All right, somatic experiencing. The man in this picture is Peter Levine, and I have quite a few of his books listed in the bibliography. He developed a way of working with narrative and touch, or how we are in our bodies. How, do we, how are we feeling in our body? And he isolated different ways of, of bringing experiences together, sensation, image, behavior, or usually as gesture. Like, I'm always watching gesture. Um, affect, which is how I, we, we feel, our emotional self, and how we make meaning of that. So we're really working with a story, and we're working with the autonomic nervous system. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm going to talk about that. But really what, what I work with in the perinatal field are these implicit memories. Sometimes these memories are not perinatal. They can be from overwhelming events that we have somehow our neural anatomy is gone offline and we don't know about it yet. But I, I like this, this uh, saying from Peter Levine that it's a collage of sensations, emotions, and behaviors. And often if we're having an experience and there's an implicit memory that rises up, it can feel like we're there in the moment. We can, we can feel like now we're experiencing that awful time back then. But really in the now, there's nothing happening. So we work a lot with orienting and reorienting people and we go back and forth between overwhelming states and more positive states. So we work a lot with resourcing, and we go back and forth, and we take little tiny chunks and we digest them. Let me show you. So what we're working with really are sequencing. We all do things in a sequence. There's a beginning, a middle, and end. There's a, an intention to move, a movement, a gesture, and then a completion. Preparation, action, follow through. And while we're doing these things, especially if we're under threat or danger, there's usually a natural protective gesture that will arise. It just arises. So if there was an oncoming car or a fall, you would, your body naturally has a way of working with it. Often these protective gestures get interrupted. 
So when we're working with someone, we slow things down and we watch for the body to speak. And the body speaks in gesture and imagery and sensation. And these are, this is my domain as a body worker. This is where I work. This is the somatic experiencing. A healthy nervous system. This is a very simplistic map. It comes from the somatic um, experiencing organization, but we all know there's a more sympathetic and more parasympathetic part of our autonomic nervous system. But actually, it's a little more complicated than that. I'm going to show you um, quickly as I go through here a little bit more. But really, think we get up in the morning, we go out into the world, we have lunch and we rest a little, and then we come, go back out and do what we need to do, and we come back and we rest at night. So we have ways that we go about working in our bodies. Some of us, of course, you know, push through 12 hours, or some of us have other ways of doing it, so everyone's different. But um, what we're working with is this nervous system regulation how we go about doing things, how we are in our body. So this is a, this is a healthy nervous system. We call it the, within our functional range. Everybody has a range of how they do things. Some people are more sensitive than others. Some people are really struggling in their bodies. Like I, I was listening to um, a podcast from Bruce Lipton. He was saying uh, not, uh, over 90% of our illnesses have no genetic in, in root that they're most of these caused by stress. So we're, a lot of us are working with a stress or inherited predisposition from transgenerational issues. And that's a, one of my big passions. Because a lot of times when people come to me, uh, often they're struggling with something they inherited from, from a stressful pattern from their ancestors, a trauma from their ancestors. So a lot of the times we're differentiating what is theirs and what belongs to the ancestors. And I do think that the ancestors are on the other side saying, give it back to me, don't carry that, don't carry that. Right. So here I like to say, I love this word curious. Because when you're in curiosity, you're not in overwhelm. You can't be overwhelmed and curious at the same time. So we're looking at these ways, of, are we relaxed, appropriately reactive? Like I know when I'm close to getting out of my functional range when I'm irritated, right? So we all probably have markers that we know. Oh, I, I'm really exhausted today. Or my digestion is off. I mean, we're looking at, um, we, can, we can find actual indicators for when we're out of our functional range. So when we get out, what does that look like? Well, here is an example of some traumatic event. Usually we'll spike up to above our range, like we'll get really scared or hyper or have to run or Something happens, but then uh, we'll drop below the range, you're suddenly exhausted. Right. And then you're above the range, and then we, we drop below the range. And sometimes we're stuck on, uh, and, uh, but both uh, the gas is foot on the gas, foot on the brake, like Joel was saying the other, last night um, at, the, uh, at the end of the movie. But there's a, these are some of the indicators that we're out of, our, uh, out of our range and we have some undischarged stress in our body. Anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, exaggerated startle, inability to relax, hypervigilance, digestive problems, emotional flooding. I, I see all this in babies. This is I, what I do. I work with babies. I educate the families about what I'm seeing. Oh, my baby's just fussy. And that's, that's probably a good reason why. And I can help you here. So what do you see when they're below the range? Depression. A flat affect, lethargy, exhaustion. Um, here we have chronic syndromes, the exhaustion syndromes. So um, you can see sometimes we'll go back and forth between hyper or hypo, but what you're looking for is something that's rhythmic and tidal. We're out in the world doing our thing, or we're action-oriented, action doing what we want, and we're coming back and we're resting. So we're looking for rhythm. So here is a very brief little illustration of what I was just talking about. The first thing, if there's something overwhelming, is there's an alert. What was that? Right? And you look around, looking for the source. And the first thing you do is you orient to safety. You're like, hey, you look to your friend, did you hear that? Are we safe here? And if you're not, well, then there's an, there's an impulse to run. And there's an impulse to fight. 
Those are all our natural instincts. And then if we can't run and we can't fight, we freeze. So what do we do? What do we do in somatic experience? We mobilize, we work, we work with feeling states. We start with feeling a safety, recognizing our resources, recognizing who we are in the now. We do a lot of resourcing. But then we start to mobilize, we move, so we go from freeze to fight, flight, fight, flight, we use social engagement there. I'm right here, I'm right here with you. Imagine your best friend here with you. Imagine your, your most favorite pet here with you. Your, if there is a beloved parent or an auntie or an uncle. So I work a lot with these memories, with these feeling states. And we orient back to safety. So really all this came to a man named Stephen Porges. And this is data from, he's, he developed this in 1995. How many here know the polyvagal theory? Nice. What I want you to think when I say polyvagal theory is recognizing, restoring, creating capacity for living fully, or reclaiming our natural instincts. Or recognizing, restoring, creating capacity for living fully. Um, I have been working with my students in the PPNE program. We have, a, we have a lot on this, and I think people take it in, and I think it's hard for them to really grasp it. So we're developing now these posters. This is the social engagement system. These are all the neural anatomy of, hey, uh, 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 I see you over there. Are you my friend? Let's talk. Oh, yeah. We have something in common. This is our neural anatomy. It's also the neural anatomy for breastfeeding. I work a lot with these cranial nerves. And here again is the vagus nerve, the wandering vagus, all the way through the body, through the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the kidneys, the liver, the, uh, the guts especially. So um, we're working with that whole system, the, 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 the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. So here's a complicated slide. It's, it's in your handout if you want to download it. It comes from John Chitty, and he has developed a lot of free resources on his website, energymedicine.com, and, and he encourages you to use the slides to explain to people. So here I told you, right, you have a nice simple slide of the autonomic nervous system rising and falling. Here's a little bit more complicated. We have a functional nervous system. And what Stephen Poor just said is that we really have these older parts of our nervous system that developed first, which was the parasympathetic. Then we have the uh, others, which is uh, more developed further along, which is a fight flight. This is our protective. This is our protective sequence, right? This is what he identified. Those are two parts of the nervous system, but then he developed a, a, this social engagement. So this is a third part of our evolution, that we are able to look to others as a species and find safety together. So here is our functional nervous system, our social. Right? This, is a, this is all the things we do. We play, we bond, we there's, have sex, we talk. We, there's a lot of things that we do when we're in that social space. And then functionally sympathetic is mobilization for daily challenge is what John talks about. It could be work, it could be action, it could be going out and playing football, it could be a lot of different things. And then there's the rest and rebuild stage. So this is all within our functional range. And you'll see he's developed it like a ladder because that the parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic is the oldest part of our nervous system, sympathetic in the middle range. And then the newest part of our nervous system is that social nervous system. Remember those cranial nerves and the heart. A unique heart, voice, face system. So how are you in your face? face. So here's our stress response. So we're looking at how we respond. And it's just like I mentioned to you. There's uh, an alert. There's a way. Can we, can we say, hey, is there something wrong? No. Oh, phew. I'm just going to feel better now. I'm going to relax. But if something is truly wrong, we mobilize together. And if we cannot get out or run away or fight, there is a freeze aspect. And uh, it, it actually is even uh, more pervasive than you might think this freeze. 
And I see this a lot in babies, and I see this a lot in children and women. We were talking about this last night. I, Anne Weinstein's research in that book has really convinced me more about how our culture uh, and women, how we are in our bodies, especially when it comes to having babies. So how do we go in? How do we make a difference here? We go through our face. I'm right here. I'm friendly. I smile. I have my eyes, and I'm listening. I'm listening with my heart to you. And then I, have, I can talk. I can talk to you in a kind way. I can use soft voice. And with babies, this is singing. This is our prosody. This is how we talk to babies. Um, but also, there's a lot we can do with our body. Touch, posture, movement, play. And I'm, I'm very fond of play, um, which I think um, adults, we can do as well, um, not just for children. But this is about our interpersonal neurobiology. This is how we are together, how we are with each other. So I've tried to figure out another image for you, the kaleidoscope. So we each have a set point for feeling safe. Sometimes we quest for safety, which is what Stephen Porges called neuroception, how we look out and we see, is there anything dangerous here? Is there anything? Our neuroanatomy looks for that. And sometimes we feel innately safe, like what is our body telling us? Our interoception, right? And there's therapy, people, places, behaviors, chemicals, trauma, all these ways that we can influence those feelings, and that's what somatic experiencing and body work and other therapies, too, can really help. This becomes part of our biology, but I want you to see that how we are together all around the environment influences how we are on the inside, and this starts, as we see, as we've been seeing prenatally. So I work with rings of experience. So the, the, the prenate, the baby, family life, cultural life. But the ancestors are part of my work as well. So these are our rings of experience. But just see, here we are again with the circles. But health is always there. Health is that, that's that blueprint. And that's what we feel, it's innate, our innate ability to heal. I'm going to talk more about that. But when it's not overwhelming, it's beautiful. Our design, our overwhelming parts, if you can discharge that, there's gifts there. And I, that's what I tell my families. Don't worry, it's going to play out. It's, there's a gift there. So we are trained to amplify health, to see what's working, to see what's right. When every family comes to me, I praise what's working. What's working? So implicit memory, that memory that's below our consciousness, it's procedural, it's in the body, it's in our cells, it's in our movements, it's in our gestures. It can be hidden, it's, it's beneath, beneath our consciousness, and I almost always find there is a relational piece. Even when I'm working a car accident, of someone who had a car accident, was somebody there? So I love this question, was anybody there for me? It's a big brain question that was coined by Mark Brady, who's one of the neuroscientists. But it has perinatal imp implications. In utero, there's constraint, or how a baby can get stuck in utero. There's the mother's experience, and then there's unexplained mysteries, which I'm going to talk more about in some of the case studies today. But birth is a sequence. So we're going to talk more about that too. So remember that humans are about patterns on every level. We're adapted and our job is to become aware of the pattern. So here's our first case study. I really hope to, uh, to illustrate uh, some of this with the working with an adult. So I want do you just to take in that slide a little bit. I'm not going to go over this man's case history. I, 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 t I find that it overwhelms people. So I'm just going to have you take it in a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about my work with him. He, uh, was, um, um, he came from far to see me. He uh, lived about an hour and a half away. And he found out about somatic experiencing, and he said, I, I, I want this. He recently had his second baby who had special needs, and she cried a lot. And he, he grew up in an alcoholic home. His father was a rageful alcoholic. And uh, 
when she would cry, he would he would go into rage, and it, it uh, really shook him. It, he was sh ashamed, and he uh, he it overtook him. It was like in this implicit place in him, and and he sought out my services, and he was just he's just a beautiful man, a minister, and uh, very religious and very peaceful, very calm and very committed to health, to himself, to, to help him move through this place. So I, I want you to take in those concentric rings. And also I want you to know that he was a very loved baby. And his mother, even though there was a lot of stress around his conception and his birth and his first year, he was a very loved, she constantly told him that he was a gift from God. And he had great connections to the, to the natural world. And he had a deep spiritual life. So part of his healing was leaving this very chaotic, um, impoverished home. And he was adopted into a religious community where he was essentially really healed. And a lot of, a lot of these, uh, of the times when we would work to find that place of safety and connection, there was people in this community and I would say, can you see their faces? Can you see their eyes? This is that, that, that social engagement system that really is our first level of safety. And that's the first level of safety for children and babies. So how we are in our faces, right? So I, brought, I would bring that in. And so we worked initially to really find those places of safety. I remember a moment with him when he, could, he couldn't feel inside his body at first, which a lot of people can't, right? So he would feel around his body. And when he started to play with protective gesture, his eyes got so wide. Like, oh my God, I feel, I feel protected. I feel safety. I remember that moment very clearly. And once we had established a baseline for safety and connection, um, we worked with these places that were very difficult and the, the rage place, and also what he discovered inside himself was a deep freeze. And for those of you who are raised in chaotic homes, especially a rageful adult who was around and somewhat unpredictable and violent, um, he would go into a freeze state. And so gradually, slowly identifying these parts, we would slowly come in and feel that a little bit and go back to a safer place. And, this is called pendulation and titration in somatic experiencing. And slowly, slowly, that place of, of freeze would melt, and he would describe the melting. And uh, it, we, he came to me over a period of months, and it was, uh, it was just an honor to work with him. But what I want to share with you is the last time I saw him. I'm going to read to you from my clinical notes. I did something with him that I do every, every once in a while. I, I asked him to try and find his prenatal or preconception self. So, uh, so he came with nothing remarkable to report. So we had gone through most of his process and he was feeling comfortable. When I questioned him about, about how he integrated his experience from last time, he said he remembered that his anger thawed the freeze place in a hurry, and that his anger was less explosive now. I had him do the exercise of connecting with his preconception place. So what I asked him to do was just in your own way, just, just in a gentle way, can you think about yourself before you came into your body? And he thought of himself as a golden ball being held by a loving presence that he could see his home as a small, dark place. So I asked him just to hang out above his home. And I said, what do you think drew you into form? At first, he didn't want to do this. I think that the exercise of the dark, seeing his dark home scared him. So I said, well, you know, what is it that you think then drew you down? And then he said, well, there's beauty all around. A beautiful natural world. So I tried to have him connect with that place, this felt sense of this, this nature. 
and he said he had difficulty, so he was sitting. So I had him uh, put him on the table. I work on a table a lot of the time. So then I held him in the craniosacral therapy, which I'm going to talk to you about. And this therapy really helps connect with the innate health in us. So I asked him again, what is it that, what is it you're feeling that drew you down? And he said, well, the natural world evoked a sense of wide space. Fresh air, opportunity, future, hope, yes, jump in. Those are his words. So when I asked him if there was anywhere in his life right now that he felt this way, in the now, as a man, he said, oh, it's all around me now, here, in these pastoral fields at Virginia, where I live. So off the table, he said, he felt such peace then. I asked him um, more, I said, how is it to find your preconception divinity in yourself now? And because he was a minister, I said to him, wasn't it Jesus who said that the kingdom of heaven is here on earth? So he reported then that um, his, he had felt peace within himself, his parents, his life. And I reflected back to him how it was to find his spiritual beingness embodied here on earth. How optimal an experience that was. And how it almost moved me to tears, and it still does, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to pause for a second. That's just story number one. So I just want to ask you to pause too, just take in now this view, the blue sky. We're about to shove off to our next port of call. So it's open sky, calm seas. Okay, so I'm shifting now. I'm doing a time check here, so I am going to finish on time. So I am trained in perinatal trauma resolution. And this examines early patterns, which are implicit memories of the prenatal period. It combines the felt sense of these early body memories. So it's sensation coupled with experience, and it sometimes can be intense. But it's on a continuum, okay? There's near-death experiences that many of us have in this shortest, longest journey, that short, or as Karen Strange would say, through the whole. But I want to tell you that there's more than just the trauma, that it's empowering to be born, that it can even be fun and ecstatic. So I would like to hold that for our families, that it's not all about the difficulty. And it's been part of my passion, and I think there are other people in this room too, to really evoke that in people. In our human design, there is, there is something really amazing about being born. And I talk about this with my families that come to see me. So these are the tools I work with families, I work with mothers, I work with mother-baby dyads, and I also work with groups, which I don't have time to talk about today. So here's our, historic, our historical pioneers, Otto Rank with his first book in 1924, The Trauma of Birth, Stan Groff, who really pioneered our coex system of memory, understanding birth, what a remarkable man. What an incredible man. Um, I've heard him on, uh, being pressured by people interviewing him, and, and uh, he can hold his own about these births, um, his evidence-based. I really love Stan Groff. And then Frank Lake, and then William Emerson, and it was William Emerson who was my, he was my first contact coming into working with perinatal work. But I just want to point out, again, we're working with sequencing. We're coming into form, we're conceived, right? We implant, we develop, we're an embryo, and birth is a sequence. Remember, in somatic experiencing, we do everything as a sequence of intention, follow through, action, follow through, so is birth. 
And there are imprints that happen here. Babies participate in birth. They go into the inlet, they engage, they turn, they go out. Then hopefully there's a pause, but often there is not. And the skin to skin is where there's a slowdown. Right? So what we're working with again is layers of experience. So we see the ancestors in the middle there. Conception, pregnancy, or the prenatal period, birth, and bonding. So here are the layers that we work with when we're trained in perinatal work. It's slow and it starts preconception. We also include attachment. And we look at these many different ways and different things that can happen prenatally. And also during birth, how we're born. Are we born with a chemical um, augmentation with like Pitocin? Are we cesarean section? Is there surgery? Is there other ways we're helped out? Other things that happen. Is it a fast birth? Is it a long birth? Who is around the birth? So why is this important? Why, why, would, why would someone really want to know this? Why is this important? So for those of us who are trained in this, we get it in our bodies. It's, it, we, we learn it. We feel it. And it's taken me a long time. Now I've taken many trainings, assisted many trainings, and uh, once you feel it, once you get it, once, like Wendy Ann McCarty says, you, the veil lifts, you get it. And if there's a baby or an adult in your care who gets it, that you get it. It's amazing. It's like, um, was it the movie last night? Or it was Gerhard Troth who said, to be understood is to be loved. So this is why we study this. We understand it, we feel it, we get it. So what is the baby's experience now? There's conception, which I don't have on this slide, but there can be an in utero constraint. I see a lot of babies that have this, babies that are very um, stuck, and their bodies are stuck. And in the layers, in the tissue, are feelings. So I slow down and I work with them and I, I, I work with the mother and teach the parents how to do it as well in many different ways. Through tummy time, through touch, through massage, through presence, through song, through movement, through rhythm. So those are the more difficult cases, I think, that in utero constraint. But there's the mother's family, there's mother's stress, there's joy, there's connection. There's the womb environment. I've learned a lot about, from midwives and doctors about babies playing in the womb. I mean, we don't just sit in there and have hard times, <laughs> you know? It's fun. And then there's a the birth experience. So I want to talk about our, our, our score. This is our early experiences score, and this is what Marty Glenn and I are developing now. And uh, they, we've developed, like the adverse childhood experiences, our own version. And we isolated what we think are truly adverse. Because not all the birth patterns and interventions and things are adverse. I've met some babies who've had cesarean sections who basically say, thank God you got me out of there. And for them, it's not an adverse experience. So I just want to hold that. Like not all of the things that happen are, are negative, right? And often the negative can be coupled with something very positive. So we slowly separate them. So here's our list. Being unwanted, abortion, ideation, or attempt. Conceived by assisted reproductive technology. And in, even though these babies are very, very wanted, there's often a lot of stress involved and in previous loss. So that's why it's here on the list. That's the only one I would say, hmm, is there? Yes, it's an adverse. Survivor of a twin or other multiples loss. Was a mother depressed or anxious? Or were the cigarettes or alcohol consumed? Was there a domestic violence or loss during pregnancy? Was there a traumatic birth or a NICU experience? And was there separation, circumcision, surgery, or hospitalization? But I want you to take in the resiliency score. And you can go and take the score. It's on our website, birthpsychology.com. Someone wanted me. And I do this in the now, too. They're like, who in the now? Someone welcomed me. Someone was talking about welcoming yesterday, was it? Really? I really want to feel welcome. It was, it was Lukbeth. 
Let me keep that. Yes. Seen and heard. I see you. I hear you. Yeah. The sense of belonging. You belong. Or safety. Secure. Do you feel secure? I often don't use the word safe. Uh, secure. Stable. You feel protected. Understood. Like somebody really gets me. Loved. Curious. That might begin. I love that word. I'm really curious. Engaged. Support. Purpose. Gratitude. A sense of home. And then a coherent story which comes from the research and attachment that's making sense of your history. Making sure it stays in the history. It doesn't have to be um, made less if it's intense, but as long as it's in the history. So again, here's our remember key. Remember that humans are about patterns. And I'm coming to our next case study. Okay, so this is a difficult birth. This is a family, and I, the reason why I want to talk about this is I, I worked with the dad. It was working with the dad that turned this story around. Um, even though I work a lot with moms and babies, I feel like fathers really hold a lot for the family, so I work with them. And then if you're right now feeling like you had a difficult birth, I just want to remind you of our guidelines. Feeling your seat, feeling your feet, and know that this is not your story. And this couple is doing really well, actually. So this is a first time baby, and, and this is, they, this is a, this amazing couple. They were just beautiful. They, they, they came to me, and they came to all my classes. I offer a lot of different kinds of preparation classes, and, and she came for massages. But she had a lot of bleeding and difficulty in first trimester, so she stopped working. And, uh, and then uh, the, the birth itself, was she was two weeks late. And the baby was very still inside. The baby did not move. In fact, the midwives were constantly trying to get him to move. And what we didn't know, what we know now, is that he had a, a velamentous cord insertion. And I'm still learning about what this means, but it, it basically it means that there's veins and arteries that extend out of their protective warts and jelly, so they're very delicate. And so what we, what we surmised is that the baby was very still as to not bother this very delicate uh, life vessel, life cord to his placenta. Smart baby. But his, his in, in utero constraint or his stillness led to a lot of compression in his body and a lot of fear. And um, I'll, t I'll get to this, but... So they were two weeks late and the, the baby, they were um, induced with a Foley catheter. And our, so this is just the catheter that's inserted into the cervix which starts it, it to be wide, widening. Like I'm not a midwife, there are midwives here, I know you all probably know this better than I do, but they walked and then they fell asleep. And then they immediately were woken up by, by intense labor. She went from asleep to extremely active labor. They had the baby in two hours. So the baby came out like a rocket. And uh, this is a precipitous birth. This is hard for babies and for moms. And some, some moms not. You know, some moms like, yeah, I liked having it. I have precipitous births. I can tell you they're hard from the mom's perspective too. So baby came out really blue and really fast and his cord came with him. So for those of you who don't know, that, that, that's really tough. When the cord comes, that means the placenta is up in the uterus, and they had to manually remove the uterus. So the midwives dashed in and grabbed it with their hands. So they stick their hand way up, and they pull it out. So I'm just going to pause for a second here. That's a very difficult pattern. I don't know if anyone here has had that, but um, it's hard on the mom, and it's hard on the dad watching. right? So they called me, uh, I didn't know all of this at first, but they called me because the baby did not sleep. And they, they thought, and the baby was tongue-tied, but the baby, I don't, I don't know if the baby was truly tongue-tied. Even though we're seeing a lot of this right now, for those of you who are working with babies, uh, basically this baby held his body like this, right? Right, you see that? So his jaw was closed. And his hands were fisted and his shoulders were up around his ears. So this is a very stressed baby. 
and he also had his eyes so wide you could see the white around his iris so you're looking at that startle it's a startle exaggerated startle so this boy this baby was scared and i'm, I'm sure it started prenatally so he, he could not sleep he could not rest he screamed and screamed so i I went and I taught them baby massage. I did craniosacral therapy. And I did um, try to help them make sense of what happened for their baby. But the mom kept coming in for baby massage. And as I was watching her, I realized she was sinking into deep, de deep depression because she was not sleeping well. And then, uh, so I referred her to psychiatrists uh, along with the dad as well, because I felt like this family was having a huge response to this very difficult birth and I worried for her health and the baby's health and the dad's health. So I did a lot of work with this family and I watched him grow and he, he was very hard to settle. So I continually worked with this family, played with this family and I, um, I just did body work on the mother and I did all I could to teach settling skills. But the um, upshot was I, I had the dad come in. And I, I did this by myself, but normally I have someone else who's with me. And I sat next to the, to the dad on the couch. And his, his wife and baby were playing on the playroom. And I came next to him, and I settled deeply into my body. And then I put my hand on the back of his back, right behind his heart. And for those of you who work polyvagally, you'll know this will increase vagal tone. It helps regulate the heartbeat to have contact with someone very regulated. And I put my hand on the front of his body. I held his heart. I asked his permission. All this touch was negotiated. And I had him go through the story. And he would get to a place that was tough for him. And he would cry. And I think there was a lot of feeling of helplessness and rage, watching his wife have so much pain and having that manual removal of, the, of his placenta. And so he would get to a place and he would, he would start to hold his breath and I would encourage him to have his feelings and I would normalize, normalizing, because I spent a lot of time with midwife, lowest results, normal, this is difficult, this is very difficult, yes. And I would listen and I would normalize and then I would tell him, Okay, now look around the room and find something here. Just, I know that orienting reflex, just look around, see that you're here. And we did that several times. He would go through parts of the story, I would hold him, I would regulate, and I would pause. And then I would bring him back to the now and have him find something pleasurable in the now. So the last round, his eyes set on his wife and his child. Now at this point, the baby's about 13 or 14 months old, and uh, the baby, of course, who couldn't settle, never settled, was so still watching his father and listening to his father. And his, his wife was sitting there just beaming love at him. And he said, I didn't see this. I like my wife, my baby, I, I like that. I said, good, take that in, take that in and really get it that they survived, and you all survived. Okay. Yes, everyone's taking a deep breath down here in the front row. So take a breath. We're on to our third port of call. We're sort of rounding out our little trip here on the journey heading back towards shore. But we just have one more therapy, craniosacral therapy. Now craniosacral therapy is um, uh, a beautiful therapy. It's gentle and it involves light touch to the craniosacral system, which of course um, is not just the head. A lot of people are saying, what's well, just cranial stuff? Um, well, it's not just the head, it's the sacrum, but it's more than that. I can access the cranial system through anywhere in the body. In fact, I like to work with the feet quite a bit. I love the collarbone. Um, these are all places I can feel the rhythm, and what we're feeling for is a, is a rhythm, a connected flow. 
a help in the body and in the client. There's a natural flow that they've been able to find. And this is, comes out of the osteopathic tradition, which I'll narrate for you. So just um, we listen to the story with our hands. We're able to feel if there's been some kind of uh, some kind of assault to the body, whether it's emotional, whether it's a fall, or we're able to feel where there's areas of constriction. This is a very gentle touch. Now I want to remind you that I'm also a massage therapist. I can work with tissues. I work with muscles. I work with fascia. Um, but I really love this cranio. It's very light. Um, it's very good for babies because babies are mostly fluid. Um, and if there's, it's very gentle, and using gentle touch and awareness, communication, and connection to the parents, we decompress the baby using this very gentle touch. It, it began with A.T. Still, who was a pioneer physician, and he, his story was out in the West, he, uh, his whole family passed away, and he became just really dis, dis, uh, dispirited watching the medicine there treat his family and uh, so he got a little furious about that decided he would create his own therapy and this was the osteopathy and he was able to see human beings as a whole like we are a whole in our body so we are we have a deep health and we it, it has layers in it um, but we are connected and we are whole so his his approach was not only in the fluid system which I'm trained in uh, and, but also in the fascia muscles and in the bones. Now, I don't do so much work with the bones, but I want to tell you that the bones float in our body. I know it seems like we are a skeleton and we're taught that we are bones, and that's the structure, but our bones actually float in our muscles and in our fascia and in our fluid system. Following on to William, to uh, A.T. Still was William Sutherland, and it's from him where we get a lot of our knowledge about the cranial sacral therapy as he noticed that the, the bones of the cranium were made, they're beveled, they were made from movement. Now, this started when he was a young osteopath in his, in, his 19, in his 20s, so he didn't really tell people about this for a long time. He experimented on himself, so he would put uh, salad bowls and baseball mitts, and he would strap his head down with leather belts, which made him a little bit you know, crazy at times. And um, there's his wife wrote a little book about living with him during this time, um, <laughs> called the, called the cranial cranial bowl, I think. Um, you know, with thinking fingers. So uh, he it was then he discovered that that this the system that made for movement had, was coaxial. It moved up and down, so we can feel a tidal movement in the body. It has different rhythms. And you can feel the, the on the, the fascia, you can feel the bone moving, you can feel muscle. Uh, but basically, we're, we're, we're feeling those very, very deep places in our body. And the very deeper places, they emerged um, in a 50-second cycle up and down. And this is what our old osteopaths called the breath of life. And they were Christian mystics, and you have to understand that's where they were at the time. But there is a deep um, uh, mystery there's deep intelligence in our bodies, and we're trained to feel it with our fingers, and uh, we listen, we listen deeply to the body. Following on, there's John Upledger, who popularized it with craniosacral therapy, along with, with um, Franklin Sills, who I'm trained in his tradition out of the UK. But many, many other instructors follow on, including Bridget Fixmans, who I mean, now we're integrating. We've, we've entered a new phase, in my opinion, around body work. We can do a whole lot more with that. We know so much more about presence and touch and our verbal skills, asking people to notice. Just notice. Notice your body. Notice. Like me noticing right now, I'm, I'm feeling the, I feel the end of our presentation coming. I can feel a little settling in my body. Right? Just notice. Right? So babies tell the story of what happened with gesture with posture, with crying, with movement, right? I have baby's hands. I love the hands of a baby. They tell me so much. If they're clasped, if their thumb is in, if their one finger is out, if their hands are open, I, I watch a baby's hands. They tell me so much about how they're feeling in their body, right? So what are we seeing? We're seeing all these things. We're seeing asymmetries, tongue ties. We're seeing Babies that cry, babies that can't feed, um, babies that can't burp, like 
the, so much pain, so much going on in them, uh, this inability to settle, and a lot of confusion with our parents. Like, why? What's going on? What can I do? The good news is that we can do a lot. So here is our poster series illustrating the autonomic nervous system, which I've shared with you already what that is. But looking at it in total here, there's bonding, which is this connection between the mother to baby, and a lot goes on for, for mom. It's not just the baby. Well, babies don't come by themselves to my office. The mother often brings them. So often I'm working with the mom. Sometimes I found if I work with the mom, I work with the baby. So we're having this, uh, this really this huge surge of understanding our affect how we are in our bodies emotionally, it also is physically, and that's what babies are about. They're about gesture, they're about movement, they're about telling. They want you to see them and get it. So we're discovering infants at the same time we're discovering this autonomic states. We can really make a difference by understanding this. So this is what I see. I see the stress response, the crying, the jerky movements, the spitting up, gosh, reflux. Difficulty eating, difficulty pooping, right? So, what do I do? I, this is a social engagement. Like, I work a lot with social engagement. I say, hi. I say, I see you. I see you. But on the inside, I'm repeating what John Chitty told me to say, which is, I know where you come from, and I know why you're here. Babies come from a special place. They're brand new in their bodies. They're super sentient. I'm feeling in my body when I'm with them. I'm negotiating space, and I'm looking for that social engagement. And I don't force that, because sometimes that's the only way babies can control their environment, is to look away. So working with the vagus nerve, I work with touch, I work with understanding. Safety first. So slowing down, skin to skin, harmony in the surround, that's working with the couple. I have lots of stories I can tell you about working with couples and babies. Babies are aware. They're constantly communicating, wanting connection. They're hardwired for love and joy and delight. And they understand. And many of them are very sensitive. Right? So I teach a lot about harmony in the surround. I teach about connection teach about settling, and I teach about how to be with babies when things are hard. The mom's body is a healing body. So like I say often, when I'm working with a family, I always treat the mom. I help her feel better in her body. My baby care takes me is uh, something from one of my clients a way long ago, when I first started doing this work in the early 2000s. But John Shitty is fond of saying the baby is a hitchhiker on the mom's autonomic state. It's how they are in their body. So I help, I help moms feel better and I help dads feel better too. And sometimes the grandmother, right? So how does body work help? Well, I want to tell you I have these research. I did some literature reviews. I annotated them and I described them. And they're up on the internet, but I got to tell you, thank God for the Touch Research Institute and Tiffany Field. She really brought body work forward. Uh, so, but there's also the Infant Massage USA. Um, they also are very powerful. And more and more data is coming out about how the, the importance of touch and nervous system regulation and healing, and healing for babies in particular. The craniosacral therapy. That the research is actually mixed, um, so I think that the scientists are often questioning. But uh, you'll see from the research I've prepared for you that there are some big cohorts of babies that have actually crying and settling was, in, was improved. So there was one of 1,200 babies that was done by Viola Fromm. Viola Fromm. She was an old osteopath who really did a whole lot for babies and trained a lot of chiropractors and osteopaths. She's one of our elders recently passed. But there's also these myofascial approaches. I've been trained in something called functional Bowen method. This is basically working with the fascia. I've seen it restore jaw function, release the hyoid bone. Um, there's also tummy time and there's a Michelle Emmanuel who's been pioneering this combination of the polyvagal reclaiming restoring, 
creating capacity with tummy time and movement. And there, there's also infant development movement in education, the body-mind centering. So there's a lot that's out there. Okay, coming to our final case study. This is the baby that did not sleep. So this mom, she, came, she brought her baby to me. Uh, I, I was the last person on the line, right? So the, through the medical doctors, through the lactation consultants to, okay, go see the craniosacral therapy. Uh, she said, I heard about you, I'm at my wit's end. My baby has not slept an hour and a half since she was born. So I really want you to take that in, right? Here's a mom who ha also has not slept more than an hour and a half in four months. So those of you who support moms, you know what it looks like. What it, I mean, I was worried about this mom, right? So what she, what she did is she came in and she told the birth story. Now the baby was amazing. She was just really social, very joyful, big, huge grin, and her arms were way out like this, right? So immediately I'm thinking, okay, what's that? Because most babies come in, their arms are like this, right? You know, they don't, they don't, they don't do this most of the time. I've seen babies subsequently to this baby who do that. So I'm already thinking, all right, there's a gesture. That says, telling, she's telling me something with that gesture. So the mom told me the birth story. I'm going to tell it to you. So she's just an older mom, and she uh, really wanted this baby. So babies really wanted. And, but she had difficulty with the pregnancy. She, uh, she's vegetarian, so her health was constantly, she's constantly tired. And so it's, it's for her, she described it as being constantly fatigued, and uh, her iron was low, and things like that. But what was the hardest thing for her is that she had premature rupture of memories at 37 weeks. I want to tell you that this is one of the most difficult patterns that you'll see because it lies in mystery. Why does this happen? We don't really know. We're getting closer to understanding because often it could be the baby that starts it. But if you don't go right into labor, the, depending on who your, uh, who your person is that's watching you, they have different policies, right? So for this mom, the practice was if you don't start into labor right in 12 hours, you have to come in. Well, her, uh, her doctor, her husband was out of town, and this was a premature rupture, and so she went in, she was by herself. And she was with a medical doctor she didn't know very well. It was a very large medical practice, and he didn't speak English very well. So immediately she's scared, and he's scared, because she's not going into labor, and so they put her right onto Pitocin. This is a very difficult way to go into labor. Inductions can be quite uh, simpler or calmer, but this baby, this mom, they, they, Pitocin. And she did not want an epidural, you know, she wanted a natural birth. So this was very disappointing for her, and as she was telling her story, we would get to a place where she would cry. Now I did the same thing with her that I did with the father. I, my body next to hers, I regulated my body and I put my hand behind her heart, and I, had, I affirmed everything that she said. Yes, that was hard. Yes, and this normalizing, and I would listen with my hands and with my body. I didn't do anything else. I just affirmed, and I watched the baby. If the baby started to go in distress, it would do something different, but the baby, right? So um, she eventually did have an epidural only after she was threatened with a cesarean section. That's not really a way, I think, to uh, treat a woman in labor. But she ended up having a, pushing the baby out. The baby was actually tongue-tied, which I'm wondering if it was tongue-tied. But um, anyway, she, she was supported. Um, lactation, breastfeeding was very difficult. This baby was very small, but joyful, right? My hand's like this. Um, so I, I could tell this woman was at her wit's end, and, the, and it was, we were going to have to do something here. So I did something I would, probably wouldn't do on the first visit, which is something called supported attachment. So I said, all right, well, let's try this. So I, I, uh, what, what supported attachment is, is you put the baby on the mum, and you have the baby crawl to breast. This is something that perhaps maybe wasn't done and when she had the baby. 
Um, but when the baby can crawl to breast, sometimes they'll tell you their story. So I did this with the mom. I laid her on my couch, I we took off her shirt, I put the baby on the breast, I supported the baby at the feet, and the baby began to crawl to breast without her hands. Her hands were out like this, right? So I said to the baby, I see here that you're not using your hands, you know, you can use your hands. And just by saying that, baby all of a sudden used hands, right? And she talked to us. She all the way to the breast. And when she got on the breast, it was all the way on the breast. And we I listened, I affirmed, yes, that was hard. Yes, that happened. Yes, I hear you. Yes. And the mom and baby fell asleep on my couch, right there. So I put my hands kneeling beside them with one hand on each, the baby and the mom. I held them in the craniosacral therapy, right? very light, very present, feeling the natural rhythms, that innate intelligence in this dyad. Right? So she gets it, wakes up, they both get dressed, they go home. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I'm worried about this family. right? The next day I get this email. We came home straight and laid down tummy to tummy, and she nursed and dozed and then we both nodded off for an hour. She seemed very content yesterday evening, and we had an easeful bath massage nursing time. She slept in her cradle swing from 7 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. Eight and a half hours. At which point she nursed vigorously for 20 minutes and then went right back to sleep till 6.45. Not only a long sleep for her, but an hour later than usual. Thank you for all your kind insights and words. I felt a sense of relief after our session and a broader understanding of just how traumatized I was after our birth. I have a feeling that as I can clear some of this up for myself, the baby will relax as well. So what was the mechanism there? What helped turn this family around? All right, almost done here. We're heading back. Oops. All right, so I just want you to see there are positive imprints that happen too. I've gone through some of these, but I like to call them constellations. So here we are in our journey. Thank you for coming with me. I'm going to use this positive list as our star to chart our course home, a map to steer by. Mom and baby are conscious and prepared. Love making is tender and intentional. Conception and implantation are easy. The baby is welcomed on discovery and no ideation about termination. The placenta is in a good spot, meaning not down by the cervix, not by the exit where the baby can go up. But there's a little stress. I'm hoping you're getting that this is an ideal constellation. Good prenatal care, prenatal bonding, Optimal birth, self-attachment and breastfeeding, when necessary, the self-attachment sequence. Neonatal period is relaxed, no, no, no difficulty ancestrally. So we all live with our patterns, right? There are variations on the pattern. And our job is to become aware of the pattern. OK, so we're heading to shore. In fact, maybe we're there already. And a wise man told me that when you have an audience, you make them feel welcome. You tell them stories. And you leave them a gift. And this gift is a poem I'm going to read to you, and it's in your Dropbox. Some of you may know it, Babies Don't Keep. Mother, oh mother, come shake out your cloth. Empty the dustpan, poison the moth. Hang out the washing, make up the bed. Sew on a button and butter the bread. Where is the mother whose house is so shocking? She's up in the nursery, blissfully rocking. Oh, I've grown as shipless as little boy blue. Lullaby, rockabye, lullaby, loo. Dishes are waiting and bills are past due. Pat a cake, darling, and peek. Peekaboo, too. The shopping's not done and there's nothing for stew. And out in the yard, there's a hullabaloo. But I'm playing Kanga, and this is my Rue. Look, aren't his eyes the most wonderful hue? Lullaby, rockabye, lullaby, loo. 
The cleaning and scrubbing can wait till tomorrow, but children grow up as I learn to my sorrow. So quiet down, cobwebs, dust go to sleep. I'm rocking my baby, and babies don't. <laughs>